Thank you, Dean Walker. Thank you for the blessing of this invitation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. I would like to acknowledge with joy uh, the blessing of being part of this lecture series. I was delighted to be invited and to accept the invitation for several reasons. I was blessed to meet and appreciate Jim Dunn when my wife and I attended the 2009 Cooperative Baptist Fellowship General Assembly after our congregation, New William Church, was organized. Dr. Ray Higgins, who was coordinator of CBF of Arkansas, made sure I met all of the people who were in the need to know. And therefore, that meant I had to meet Jim Dunn. I was immediately impressed by that straight-talking, bow-tie-wearing fellow who was unmistakably Baptist in all of the good ways. His love of God, his religious liberty, affection, his commitment to truth-telling struck a chord with me. And uh, he was not allergic to getting into good trouble. Bill Leonard, who is here this evening, and I share the good fortune to contribute articles for Baptist News Global. I enjoy reading Bill's work, and he's been kind to encourage me. It's good to be in the place where Bill has served, and I thank him for being present this evening. But I jumped at the invitation to come to Wake Forest Divinity School because Dr. Corey Walker extended it. I will never forget hearing Dr. Walker on a panel during the Alliance for Baptist General Annual Meeting in Washington, D.C. several years ago. When Dr. Walker asked me to come to Wake Forest to deliver a lecture named after Jim Dunn, I thought about Dr. Gardner Taylor, Dr. William Barber, Reverend John Mendez, who's here. It's good to see him. And I quickly accepted the invitation before Dean Walker could change his mind. <laughs> I must thank Anna Harris and Sue Robertson for making the arrangements for me to travel here and be comfortable. Please do not hold them or Dr. Walker responsible for my remarks. Now, let me talk with you about what will Baptists do about Jesus. That's what I like to talk about. What will Baptists do about Jesus? I am not talking about whether we will sing songs about him, whether we will offer prayers to him, whether we will claim affiliation with Jesus. And I say this and take a pause because I need to give acknowledgement to the people of New Lynn Church who said, make sure you extend our gratitude. New Lynn Church, we always gather and remind ourselves we are one people by affirming our oneness with these words, we pledge, we praise and worship God together. We petition God together. We proclaim God together. We welcome all persons in God's love together. We live for God in every breath and heartbeat by the power of the Holy Spirit as followers of Jesus Christ together. The new millennium would not want me to be here without telling you that. And I wanted to do that so I can go back home. <laughs> what will we do about Jesus who strolled into Jericho on his final trip to Jerusalem to observe Passover and invited himself to dine at the home of a fellow named Zacchaeus? Before you answer, Allow me to put my question in a context you will find, I hope, interesting, if not challenging. In her preface to the 1619 Project, journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones observed that historian and journalist Theron Bennett Jr. documented that African people had lived on the land that in 1776 would become the United States since 1619. When a ship named the White Lion arrived at Jamestown, Virginia, a year before the Mayflower arrived. 
black Americans were enslaved, kidnapped, transported, sold, whipped, castrated, raped, terrorized, and abused in other ways from 1619 for the next 246 years. Their descendants have received nothing to repay, repair, or otherwise account for the legion of wrongs they suffered. That is a colossal moral, ethical, social, political, economic, and humanitarian issue. Yet it is one about which theologians have rarely commented. I have been a follower of the religion of Jesus since my parents and other black elders introduced me to it during my childhood. My faith, like that of my Baptist parents, and elders, ancestors, was forged by the religion of Jesus taught and preached from the Bible, set to music in Negro spirituals and gospel songs, and pondered in black congregations. I turned away from Eurocentric Christianity almost 40 years ago when I dropped out of seminary extension studies sponsored by Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. The prospect of being credentialed by the religious system that gave moral, ecclesial, and ethical approval to land theft, invasion of indigenous societies, genocide, chattel slavery, imperialism, white supremacy, militarism, wealth privilege, patriarchy, sexism, bigotry, terrorism of LGBTQI persons, technocentrism, and xenophobia was intellectually and morally and ethically disgusting to me. Instead, my theological perspective is bottomed on how the religion of Jesus has been interpreted by Negro spirituals and gospel songs. My, my theological luminaries are Howard Thurman and James H. Cohn and South African liberation theologian Alan Buzak. My ethics is inspired by Henry Highland Garnett, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, yes, Nat Turner, W.E.B. Du Bois, Mother of the King Jr., Baptist, Malcolm X, who was Baptist before he became Muslim, Katie Cannon, Emily Towns, Baptist, Kelly Brown Douglas, and Cornel West, Baptist. My pastoral theology is guided by reading, writings from Peter Paris and the examples of Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr., and G. Alfred Smith, Baptist, and Amos Brown, Baptist. My hermeneutics and my homiletics are built on the writings by Walter Brueggemann, Walter Rushenberg, William Sloan Coffin, William Augustus Jones, Baptist, the work of Gardner Taylor, Baptist, Samuel DeWitt Proctor, Baptist, Henry and Ella Mitchell, Baptist. These people rescued my faith in the religion of Jesus from Eurocentric Christianity with its devotion to personal and commercial and social and geopolitical empire. And I mention their names to emphasize that my exposure to their work and their ministries happened outside any seminary context. In scripture, righteous and righteousness are words about honesty, truth, and justice. So when Jesus pronounced a blessing on people who hunger and thirst for righteousness at Matthew 5 and 6, he was commending people who have a passion for honesty, truth, and justice. He was not commending people who cheat, steal, lie, and misuse power to oppress others. The encounter between Jesus and the chief revenue commissioner of Jericho named Zacchaeus, recorded at Luke 19, clearly makes this point. 
People remember Luke's account of that encounter for different reasons. Some people are impressed by the fact that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus so much that he, a wealthy man, went to the trouble and the humility of climbing a tree. Alan Buzak has written that Zacchaeus was so despised that being in a tree was probably the one place he felt safe. Buzak writes, quote, it was not just because he was a man of small stature. The people knew him. He knew that he would not be welcomed by them. Why would anyone give up their place in the crowd and their chance to see Jesus for someone like him? Amongst the crowd, the hostility would have been palpable and perhaps physical. That tree was the safest place for him. It was also a symbol of his isolation. Amongst the poor and oppressed, those extorted by men like Zacchaeus every day of their lives, but expectant and hopeful that day, Zacchaeus would have not been made to feel welcome. Close quote. Some people point to the fact that Jesus addressed Zacchaeus by name, invited himself to dine with him, and was welcomed into the house of this rich fellow. How did Jesus know Zacchaeus? The narrative is silent about those points. We also don't know how long the meal lasted or what they ate. But we do know that Jesus and Zacchaeus talk long enough and deeply enough for Zacchaeus to reconsider how he became so wealthy. Zacchaeus promised to refund four times the value of any of his wealth obtained through fraud, meaning through dishonest means. And Zacchaeus promised to give half of his possessions to the poor. Let me drill down on that. Zacchaeus committed to transfer half of his wealth to impoverished people. The result of the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus was that the man voluntarily pledged to divest himself of half of his wealth and redistribute it to people who were poor. Now, he wasn't talking about making a charitable donation to the Jericho branch of the Salvation Army. And Zacchaeus wasn't talking about setting up a Zacchaeus foundation for the study of poverty. He was talking about giving away half of what he owned so that he and his poor neighbors would know income security. To pledge to give half of his wealth to the poor demonstrates what Brian Stevenson, who is the head of the Equal Justice Institute, has said about poverty. According to Stevenson, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Justice is always about the fair use and distribution of power and resources. A society where some people are extraordinarily wealthy while others are poor is unjust because resources, including but not limited to money, and other possessions are unfairly withheld by the wealthy few and not redistributed for the numerous poor. It is unjust for wealthy people to have much more than they need while poor people suffer because they do not have what they need. It is unjust for wealthy people to use their extraordinary wealth to enrich themselves rather than redistribute wealth to, to benefit their impoverished neighbors. It is unjust for wealthy people to control land and refuse to share land with poor people who need housing. But that was not all. Zacchaeus also pledged a refund four times the value of anything he obtained by dishonest means. In doing so, Zacchaeus demonstrated another truth. Wealth obtained through injustice can never be justly retained. Instead, it produces damage that must be repaired and wrong that must be remedied. Zacchaeus admitted 
that some of his wealth, including the comfortable lifestyle and the lavish hospitality he could extend to Jesus, was based on dishonest gain. To hold onto that wealth was to persist in dishonesty. To trade that wealth for more wealth amounted to earning a profit on dishonesty. So when Zacchaeus pledged to give back four times the value of anything he had obtained through false, meaning dishonest means, he was pledging to make reparations. Both the pledge to divest and the pledge to make reparations resulted from the deliberate encounter Jesus had with Zacchaeus. Jesus did not go to Jericho on a whim. He did not invite himself to down with Zacchaeus for personal privilege. He did not invite himself to down with Zacchaeus to be featured in the society section of the Jericho News. Jesus went to Jericho and invited himself to dine with Zacchaeus, the chief revenue commissioner in the prosperous Jericho region because Jesus was hungry and thirsty for justice. And Jesus shows that hunger and thirst for justice requires that we challenge the ways that wealthy people have come to control so much. What unjust conduct, policies, and practices are in place that produced the land holdings of a few and the homelessness of so many? What unjust labor practices result in so many people working so hard and remaining in poverty while so few, while a few people live in luxury without lifting a finger? What labor was stolen? What land was obtained through oppressive methods? What water rights are held because people are cheated or because wealthy people preyed on the vulnerability of their less fortunate neighbors, how much should be returned because it should never have been taken in the first place? How much should be restored? What Jesus, what Zacchaeus said about restoring four times what he'd obtained through dishonest means was based on principles of restitution and reparation. Consider these passages. Exodus 22 and 1. When someone steals an ox, or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The thief shall make restitution, but if unable to do so, shall be sold for the theft. I mean, that's in the text. Leviticus 6 and 5. Or if anything else about which you've sworn falsely, you shall repay the principal amount and add one-fifth to it. You shall pay it to its owner when you realize your guilt. Or Numbers 5, 6, and 7. Speak to the Israelites. When a man or woman wrongs another, breaking faith with the Lord, that person incurs guilt and shall confess the sin has been committed. The person shall make full restitution for the wrong, adding one-fifth to it and giving it to the one who was wronged. We are finally witnessing people wrestling with racial injustice in ways they haven't done before. However, Zacchaeus shows that like people in a desert, they need help. They need prophetic people to show up like Jesus did and challenge them. And so Jesus, the itinerant preacher from Galilee, shows up in Jericho to confront the chief revenue commissioner about being unjustly wealthy. Jesus showed up to confront Zacchaeus about having twice as much as he needed to have a plenty. Jesus showed up to confront Zacchaeus about being wealthy through dishonest gain. Jesus showed up to challenge Zacchaeus to take on a life of economic repentance that involved downsizing, restitution, and wealth redistribution. And this shows that people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness like Jesus must confront the holders of unjust wealth. In obedience to the example of Jesus, we must challenge people like Zacchaeus to divest themselves of wealth obtained through dishonest means. The question is, 
What are Baptists going to do with that Jesus? That includes challenging Zacchaeus people to understand that holding on to unjustly obtained wealth is a sign of moral and ethical depravity, not financial help. In other words, people who hunger and thirst for righteousness will challenge the chaos people with the imperatives of restitution and reparation for racial injustice. And that requires admitting that the wealth of our society was built on racial injustice. Racial injustice is the original sin of this society and is embedded in its moral and ethical and religious, commercial, political, and social DNA. It also requires that prophetic people preach, whether they are clergy or not, about the debt created by racial injustice. Relief and rescue from the moral desert of reparations will not come without the kind of prophetic intervention and interaction that Jesus had with Zacchaeus. It is up to prophetic people to recognize this truth and live into it. But first, we must understand the difference between restitution and reparation. Restitution refers to an obligation owed by a person or a party to repay a debt owed or to repair a wrong inflicted on another person or a party. Reparation refers to an obligation owed by a society or a government to repay a debt owed or a wrong inflicted on persons or parties. At the heart of both ideas, restitution and reparation, is a sense that wrongful conduct has caused harm, loss, injury, or suffering to another person or party, restitution, or to a group of people, reparations. And so the question is, why has no reparation been made to black people for slavery and the racial injustice that continues from it? One reason may be explained in Isaiah 59, verse 1 through 11. You recall that one. See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue mutters wickedness. No one brings suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies conceiving mischief and begetting iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs dies and the crushed egg hatches out a viper. The way of peace they do not know and there is no justice in their paths. There are roads they have made crooked. No one who walks in them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We wait for light, and lo, there is darkness. And for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope like the blind along a wall, groping like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in twilight, among the vigorous as though we were dead. Ah, that's what it says in Isaiah. White supremacy the actual theology followed by the society, not Christianity, white supremacy, the actual theology followed by society, has shamelessly condoned and justified the greed, the robbery, the violence, the deceit, and other injustices associated with slavery and racialized oppression of black people since its inception. When European colonizers cheated, lied, and rob indigenous people of the land, water, and wages, white supremacy sacralized the operation. European governments set up colonial governments that licensed land theft, cheating, murdering indigenous people, 
and people who call themselves followers of Jesus condoned it and supported it. Then the colonizers kidnapped Africans to set up shipping companies to transport and trade enslaved Africans. Insurance companies and banks financed the whole operation. Slavery for black people was continued openly in the society for 246 years. People who called themselves followers of Jesus condoned it and supported it. The cover story in the June 2020 issue of the New York Times is titled, What is Owed? And is written by, you know, that woman, Nicole Hannah-Jones. She began the story with these words, quote, if true justice and equality are ever to be achieved in the United States, the country must take seriously what it owes black Americans, close quote. And with that introductory statement, Hannah Jones argued that this nation must move beyond slogans and undertake deep conversation about reparations for black Americans. And then she added this truth, quote, a truly great country does not ignore or excuse its sins. It confronts them and then works to make them right, close quote. Nicole Hannah-Jones, a journalist, wrote that. Not a pastor, not a preacher, a journalist. One job of religion is to challenge society to confront its sins and to work to do right by people who've been wronged. However, religious people have shown no interest in engaging in conversation about reparations. For example, you knew I was going to go here. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded in 1845. During its 150th anniversary, meeting in Atlanta, Georgia in 1995, almost 30 years ago, Southern Baptist messengers added an, adopted an eloquent resolution admitting that slavery played an, a role in the formation of the convention. The resolution admits that Southern Baptists, quote, defended the right to own slaves and either participated in, supported, or acquiesced in the particularly inhumane nature of American slavery, close quote. The resolution also laments that racism and, quote, historic acts of evil, such as slavery from which we continue to reap a bitter harvest, have separated us from our African-American brothers and sisters, close quote. The resolution resolves to apologize to, quote, all African-Americans for condoning and perpetuating individual and systemic racism in our lifetime, close quote. Yet that 1995 resolution is conspicuously, and if I may add suspiciously, silent about healing the damage, injury, and harm African-Americans suffered from 246 years of chattel slavery, another century of legalized segregation, and continued systemic practices and policies in every aspect of American society that are the legacy of that wicked history. The 1995 resolution does not contain a word about reparations. To people whose ancestors were enslaved, dehumanized, defrauded, terrorized, marginalized, and who continue to suffer from that blatant violation of divine love, truth, and justice to this day. Baylor University, the largest Baptist institution of higher education in the world, was also organized, founded, and funded in 1845. almost 190 years ago by white men who owned enslaved persons. And Bela is home to the George Truett Theological Seminary. But when the Bela Board of Regents issued a unanimous resolution a few years ago admitting its slaveholder sponsorship and purporting to apologize to it, the resolution did not mention anything about reparations. What are Baptists going to do about the Jesus who talked with Zacchaeus so long that Zacchaeus 
made a commitment to do reparations. Now, greed and robbery are root causes of racism and racial injustice. Slaveholder religion did not create greed, did not create robbery, and did not create racism. Slaveholder religion, including the religion practiced by white people who call themselves followers of Jesus, was used to justify it. Justify kidnapping, justify robbery, justify rape, justify torture, lynching, terrorism, human trafficking, and the other evils associated with slavery. We will never have a serious conversation about racial justice in this society until we talk about reparation for the moral, ethical, political, and monetary debt this society owes descendants of African people who were enslaved, robbed, cheated, terrorized, kept illiterate, and dehumanized. But we will not have that conversation about reparation until and unless prophetic people insist on it. The second reason reparations have not been paid to descendants of enslaved black persons is personally painful to me, is that we black people have been timid about demanding reparations. We've been timid in the face of white privilege. We've been timid in the face of white terrorism. We've talked about desegregating schools, restaurants, hotels, theaters, and other establishments. We've talked about voting rights. But we've not talked, we've not boycotted, we've not protested, we've not demonstrated, or otherwise made demands for reparations. Religious and fraternal organizations have not made reparations a subject at our local, state, and national meetings. In the same way we criticize white religious leaders for failing and refusing to re address reparations, we must also admit that blacks and brown leaders have also been derelict. In his book titled, The Debt, What America Owes Blacks, Trans-Africa Trans founder Randall Robinson makes this point so clearly, albeit with language that some people may find unseemly, that I will not try to sanitize his words. Quoting from Randall Robinson. Quote, the issue here is not whether we black people can or will win reparations. The issue is whether we will fight for reparations because we have decided for ourselves that they are our due. And then Robinson writes, let me try to drive the point home here. Through keloids of suffering, through coarse veils of damaged self-belief, lost direction, misplaced compass, shit-faced resignation, racial transmutation, black people worked long, hard, killing days, years, centuries, and they were never paid. The value of their labor went into others' pockets, plantation owners, northern entrepreneurs, state treasuries, the United States government, where was the money? Where is the money? There is a debt here. Jews have asked this question of countries and banks and corporations and collectors and any who have been discovered at the end of the slimy line holding in secret, secret places the gold, the art, the money that was the rightful property of European Jews before the Nazi terror. Jews have demanded what was their due and received a fair measure of it. And then Robinson writes clearly how blacks respond to the challenge surrounding the simple demand for reparations will say a lot more about us and do a lot more for us than the demand itself would suggest. We would show ourselves to be responding as any normal people would to victimization, were we to assert in our demand that for 246 years and with the complicity of the United States government, hundreds of millions of black people endured unimaginable cruelties, kidnapping, sale as livestock, deaths in the millions through terror-filled sea voyages, back-breaking toil, beatings, rapes, castrations, mutilations, maimings, murders, we would begin a healing of our psyches. Were the most public case made that whole people lost religions, languages, customs, histories, cultures, children, mothers, 
fathers and they were never made whole and never compensated not one red cent. That is what makes the encounter of Jesus with Zacchaeus so powerful. Jesus did not shirk his moral and ethical duty to confront Zacchaeus about his greed. Jesus was not afraid to call Zacchaeus out. He just refused to pass through Jericho without meeting Zacchaeus. He refused to pass through Jericho without confronting Zacchaeus and calling on Zacchaeus to make amends for anything he'd obtained by dishonest means. Zacchaeus, come down. This day I must dine at your house. Jesus refused to practice a religion that turned a blind eye to robbery. And so I asked Baptists, what about us? Jesus refused to practice a religion that condoned wage theft. What about us? Jesus refused to back down. What about us? What are followers of Jesus doing to confront this society about the unpaid and constantly mounting debt owed to the descendants of people whose lives and labor and culture and language and ancestry and religion was robbed? And what are the descendants of those robbed people doing in God's name to make the society face its moral and ethical duty, to make reparations for what has been robbed? In the summer of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, I preached about reparations for several weeks, eight weeks, for losses, harms, and injuries caused by that long legacy of history. And I keep bringing it up 246 years because people don't want to talk about it. Legalized chattel slavery, another 100 years of legalized segregation, ongoing violations of God's truth and justice. And beginning with Luke's account about Zacchaeus, I emphasize that the divine imperatives that we love God with our whole being and love one another as neighbors requires that this society make reparations for the harms and the losses and the injuries inflicted by the society upon black people. And I argue that followers of Jesus have a moral and ethical duty to lead the call for reparations. One sermon in that series pondered reparations by looking at another passage from Mark's gospel about the encounter between an unnamed wealthy man and Jesus that's found in, also in the gospels of Matthew and Luke. People have termed this story the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler. You've heard about it. However, one of the early Christian theologians, Origen of Alexandria, records in his commentary on Matthew that actually there were two people, two rich men who approached Jesus as travel. The lesson has several remarkable features, you recall. The passage states that a man of wealth and influence, ruler, approached Jesus, humbly knelt before him, addressed him as good teacher, before asking, what must I do to inherit? And the man did not appear discouraged when Jesus re reflected his flattery. When Jesus reminded him about the obligation to honor God in interpersonal relationships, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, you shall honor your father and your mother. The young man declared he'd faithfully done all that from his youth. And then Mark 10, 21 has this adding for him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Before that comment, the man seemed serious about being identified with Jesus. But when he heard that direction, he was shocked according to the passage and he went away grieving for Mark's gospel says he had many possessions. And at that point, you recall, Jesus remarked to his disciples how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were perplexed. The J.B. Phillips translation reads staggered. 
So Jesus repeated the point and drove it home with the proverb, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, of God. Jesus told the ruler, go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, then come follow me. Jesus did not welcome the man and disciple him to use his wealth to sow into his ministry. Origen of Alexandria wrote in his commentary on Matthew that Jesus said to the perplexed rich man, quote, how can you say I have fulfilled the law and the prophets when it is written in the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And many of your brothers, sons of Abraham, are covered with filth, dying of hunger, and your house is full of many good things, none of which goes out to them. Now what does that have to do with reparation? And following Jesus. Jesus refused to allow flattery to blind him to the dramatic inequality between the rich ruler and the rest of society. He directed the man to push back from his wealth to divest himself of it and to become one of the common people. Jesus directed this man to share his wealth with impoverished people Instead, the man preferred to hold on to his possessions. The Gospels do not record that he ever returned to follow Jesus, despite having initially said, good teacher. Like the rich ruler, the people who founded the Southern Baptist Convention were enthusiastic about eternal life, preaching the gospel of Jesus. But they refused to give up owning enslaved Africans. That's why they found the convention. That's why they found the convention. They refused to pay Africans for their work. They refused to treat Africans as neighbors. And to justify their greed, they established the Southern Baptist Convention, which was also the year they started the biggest Baptist and oldest continuous seminary of Baptist life in the world, Baylor. Less than 20 years later, slave holding, Bible quoting, and hymn singing white Baptists were at the forefront of what would become the bloodiest and deadliest war fought by the United States. And the last war fought on U.S. soil because they, like the rich young ruler, would not push back from slaveholder religion, slaveholder economics, and slaveholder social relationships. Let me be clear. Like the rich ruler who approached Jesus and called him good teacher, church folks stole the lives, labor, and livelihoods of millions of God's children for centuries, and they were saddened when the thought about the thought of pushing back from that stolen wealth. And like the rich ruler, church folks have tried to associate themselves with Jesus without redressing the poverty, the sickness, and the other systems, the other symptoms of systemic racism. Instead, they blame the victims for being poor. They blame the victims for not having the education. They blame the victims. Sadly, people who call themselves followers of Jesus court favor from rich ruler types to the point that congregations would rather not do what Jesus did and tell people who trust in wealth to share that wealth with people who are poor. Unlike Jesus, who taught it is hard for people who trust in wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven, People who claim to follow Jesus in this nation do not tell wealthy people to push back and divest their wealth, redistribute the value to those who are poor, and live in solidarity with those who are not affluent. Did you know that there has been a law passed for reparations? In 1862, April 16, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act. You ever heard of it? Good, I can tell you something. It is a law that called for $1 million reparations to be paid for emancipated Africans who had been enslaved in District Columbia. But the money was to go 
to the white persons who enslaved them. Who worked them without pay and who kept the proceeds from their work. The District of Columbia Emancipated Compensation Act. I do not know how many slave owners received reparations from the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862. I have no information that any of the emancipated Africans received a penny. The act included up to $100,000 to resettle formerly enslaved persons. But the resettlement was to be in Haiti and Liberia, not the United States. Now, you understand this society in the Homestead Act gave frontier land to white settlers for free. Then and now, church people with rich rule of religion were not told to push back. Instead of following the example of Jesus, who confronted the unnamed rich ruler, church people who claimed they were followed of Jesus just kept the reparations money. <laughs> Perhaps that's why our church people today are not stepping up. Let me cover it close. I contend that the love and justice of God required that followers of Jesus join the demands for reparations for black children of God who descended from the enslaved Africans. The law of Moses, the writings of the Hebrew prophets, the teachings of Jesus, especially the narrative in the Gospel of Luke about the encounter Jesus had with Zacchaeus, Support the demand for racial reparations. Now I, must, now I must stress three things. First, we must remember that reparations is a moral, ethical, and social requirement from God. From God. Unpaid debts, unrepaired injuries, unrequited harms and losses separate people from God and from each other. That reality requires that we understand reparation for racial injustice to be a theological imperative. Wealth, privilege, and status based on violence, theft, deceit, hate, hypocrisy, and fear is never based on justice and peace. And when you obtain wealth, privilege, and status by those means, you have to use more violence and more deceit and more hypocrisy and more fear to hold on to it. And the biblical lesson about Cain and Abel in Genesis 3 and about Moses and the burning bush in Exodus 3 proved the point. You recall Cain and Abel. When Cain murdered Abel, he did not escape God. When Cain murdered Abel, he did not escape God. When Egyptians enslaved and oppressed Hebrew immigrants, they did not escape God. In both instances, the biblical message is that God witnessed the violence. God witnessed the theft of life and labor. God confronted Cain and the Egyptians through Moses about that willful defiance of divine sovereignty, love, and justice. We always quote about Dr. King talking about the mark, moral arc of the universe sweeps wide, yet always bends towards justice. Justice requires that wrongs we inflict on others be made right. Justice requires that debts be repaid. Justice requires reparation. Because the universe bends towards justice, the universe bends towards reparation whether people like it or not. And until reparation is made, the relationship between wrongdoers and the people they have wronged is skewed, unbalanced, and untrue. Until reparation is made, Wrongdoers must constantly fear retribution from victims who have been robbed, brutalized, deceived, and otherwise wronged. And until reparation is made, that fear drives wrongdoers to defend their wrongful privilege 
by force. Violence begets more violence. And that leads me to help us understand that the whole issue about policing, hello, that we are dealing with in this society is rooted in centuries of sacralized and legalized violence perpetrated by white children of God against people of color and the stolen wealth obtained and distributed on racial grounds across generations. White violence, theft, deceit, hate, and hypocrisy against people of color has to somehow be sanctioned. And what better way to sanction it than to license an entire force with a monopoly to use violence. And that's why we have our system of policing. People whose greed drives them to lust after what other people have and violently grab it have to use violence to hold on to it. And that requires, in a moral universe, they have to somehow manufacture an explanation to justify doing it. Because, you know, greed and lust are not morally justifiable on their own. Hence, throughout history and in every society, humans have tried to justify premeditated and indefensible violence by claiming that religion, law, manifest destiny, science, including education, and commerce uphold it. Racism and white supremacy are perversions. Don't call them distortions. They are perversions used to justify the greed and the lust of perverted religion, perverted law, perverted science. Perverted religion, law, and science are the principalities and powers in high places that followers of Jesus have wrestled against in every era and place. And in the context of racial justice, both in the United States and elsewhere, these institutions have been used to justify stealing land and labor from people in Africa and Asia and in Australia and America, which not only gives wrongdoers a false sense of merit, it tempts oppressed people to question the goodness and justice of God. When we speak of rep reparation being a requirement, we also emphasize it's morally, socially, and ethically required. That means it has to be financial restitution, reparations, legal reparations, political reparations, education reparations, cultural reparations, religious reparations, medical reparations, emotional reparations. You understand? If you have had harm in all those areas, you have to do repair in all those areas. But societal institutions will not repair that on their own without prophetic leadership. I said prophetic. I didn't say religious. without prophetic leadership. Religious institutions and their leaders are so corrupted by the idolatry to greed and empire that most pastors, and I say this unapologetically, most religious educators, most religious bodies are morally, ethically, and institutionally compromised by white supremacy and racism, which is why what Robert P. Jones said about being white too long. You recall, Bobby Jones said, white Christians are cane and have been white too long. You need to look no further than Al Mohler, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Nine billion dollar endowment. And when black pastors in Louisville approach Mohler about Reparations, he said that wasn't, that wasn't on the table. When it comes to racial justice, most white leaders, including pastors, religious educators, and nominational leaders are blind guides. They should not be followed. Jesus said that. It's easy to criticize white people for being opposed to reparations. We should do so. But I think we need to secondly understand that Jesus didn't call Zacchaeus a monster. It's somewhat disingenuous to criticize white people for opposing reparations by terming them moral monsters. 
moral monsters should not be expected to tolerate demands for reparations, let alone consider themselves morally, ethically, or otherwise obligated to meet such demands. It's, it's self-contradictory, if not unfair, to denounce people as inhuman, monsters, and then blame them for not responding humanely to moral and ethical demands. How can you be a moral monster and be expected to respect a moral demand? And Jesus indicated in his parable about the prodigal son and the encounter with Zacchaeus that God does not call people who are sinners monsters. You recall that passage about the prodigal son. I call it the parable of the generous father. But what it proves is God is obsessed with oneness. And God goes out of God's way to restore oneness. In God's economy, all things are up to one. That's new math. That's the first math. Everything adds up to one. And God is God is stressed about anything that doesn't fit into oneness. What chance does Zacchaeus have to prophetically repent if Jesus had done like the folks who grumbled about Zacchaeus and said, why is he going to his house? So we have to make sure that we don't blame, we don't create monsters. We have to ask ourselves, are we writing people off as moral monsters? Are we prophetic people guilty of grumbling about the notion that some people are not embracing reparations? Now, we don't have a transcript about what Jesus and Zacchaeus talked about, but judging from the pledge Zacchaeus made about giving half his possessions to the poor, Jesus talked about something besides the Jericho version of who won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and he did it even though the church were grumbling about it. Taken together, these lessons teach us that God works on behalf of oppressed people. God works to confront oppressors like Cain and Zacchaeus. God treats them as moral beings, not monsters. And with God, they're not beyond redemption, restoration, and reclamation. With God, reparation is not only possible, reparation is required. With God, the lost can be found. The wayward can return. The wicked can be confronted. God believes in reparation, do Baptists. What are Baptists going to do about that Jesus? God believes that prophetic people can make a reparatory difference by confronting privileged oppressors, do Baptists. God believes that suffering people can be reconciled with people like Zacchaeus when people like Zacchaeus engage in reparations. Do we believe? Do we believe God can do through us what God did through Jesus with Zacchaeus? Do we believe in God that much? If we so, if so, then we should be following the example of Jesus and Zacchaeus. We should make a prophetic demand for reparation. We should make reparation part of the conversation. We should not be talking about reconciliation. You cannot be reconciled with people you refuse to honor a debt to. I cannot mug Brother Mendez, take his wallet, take his life earnings, deprive his family of his wealth, and then talk to his grandchildren about reconciliation while his children have been left bereft of him as a patriarch, as his influence, as head of their family, reconciliation cannot happen without reparations. Stop talking about it. Quit. Hush. If you can't say the R-E-P word, don't say the R-E-C word. Because you cannot do reconciliation without reparation. 
And if we don't believe in God that much, we should stop calling ourselves followers of the Jesus who deliberately stopped in Jericho, invited himself to die with Zacchaeus, and stayed until Zacchaeus came to himself and resolved to make restitution for his wrongfully obtained and enjoyed wealth. If we are against reparations, then we are against Jesus and Zacchaeus, no matter what we call ourselves. So I ask you, what will Baptists do about that Jesus?